Hello, and welcome to episode 50 of Talk Witchcraft Podcast. In this special episode, Maggie and I will be talking about Yule and how to celebrate and honor this traditional holiday. You're listening to Talk Witchcraft. On this podcast, we talk about witchcraft as a lifestyle and discover how to merge magic into your daily life. Every week, we'll demystify witchy topics like tarot, astrology, crystals, herbs, and more as you develop your personal brand of magic and create the life of your dreams. We're We're your your hosts, hosts, the the Mystic Mystic Sisters, Sisters, Erica and Maggie. In this segment of the show, we choose a tarot card for the week and we look for moments that relate to this card in our daily lives. For this episode, we are again choosing another major arcana card, which is sort of rare. This time we're choosing the world. And for the most part, we've been talking about the numbered minor arcana and the court cards. So the minor arcana includes the day-to-day events and the cast of characters. When we look at the major arcana, these are more like a keynote or a lesson of the story of what you're reading in your tarot reading. The theme for the world card is what's next? So if we follow the fool's journey through the major arcana, it's the archetype of the hero's journey. The world is the last thing the fool will encounter on this quest. This is the point where the hero is at the end and the end is coming home. So in a way, it's the beginning again. The key is that the hero has transformed in some way along their journey. So while their home may appear to have remained the same and the people there may view the hero in the same way they always have, the hero knows that things have changed. The world card is about recognizing that change. And it's also about the responsibility to share your new insights with the other people around you, the people at home. If you think about it as you go to school or you learn something new or you train for a profession or you get some sort of certification, you're likely going to begin a profession or practice in which you will use that training. If you do, it is then your responsibility to, of course, use your training to help others in some way, whether that is to go on to teach others about it or to do a service for them because they can't do it themselves. They haven't received that same training. So the world card is about going on this journey, going through a transformation, and then sharing that transformation with other people. Do you have a story that relates to this, Erica? For the most part, I am at the world card for my profession. And I've, I've talked about my job a lot. And I've talked about talking about my job a lot. But I'm definitely, you know, I I went to school, I got my master's, I did the first year clinical fellow thing. I did all the hard work and now I'm in this place of supervision and leadership where I'm teaching clinical fellows the first year out of school workers and then the SLPAs who have less training, ideas of ways to think about doing the job that they may have not been exposed to before or thought about, but teaching them what I have been taught. Yeah, using your lessons learned to help others and then they don't have to necessarily go through the same like challenges and struggles because you can just tell them what you already learned in those times exactly and and something that I tell parents because there is a difference between an SLPA and an SLP and it's really just the masters and sometimes parents can get kind of Like, well, why am I not just seeing the SLP? Why do I have to see the assistant? And so what I tell them is that the SLPA's training, their their base level bachelor's training is all about providing therapy. That's what they learn. My master's adds on a level of data analysis and testing and being able to look at goals and measure progress. And the SLPA's are collecting data on those goals that I can then analyze. So their whole role and responsibility is to provide therapy. Um, And then I just have that higher level thinking about, well, what are we really working on? Why Why is this important? And helping them kind of work through that clinical judgment piece that they haven't been trained on. Right. That's interesting. You use the word judgment there because the world comes right after the judgment card. But yeah. (laughs) What 
about you, Maggie? So I was thinking about this this week because I shared a reel about it was the sound is like you look over at your you look over and say like what's what's going on and then it's your diploma is looking back at you and says don't mind me just watching and I don't know what the song is that it's to but anyway I filmed that and because I laugh I got my bachelor's degree I have a bachelor's of science in rangeland ecology with a focus on restoration ecology and I use it in some ways but you know now I teach witchcraft and so this is related I swear (laughs) um So I was thinking about that this week about like, do I, you know, I got this degree, it, I don't use it though, the way that I was trained to use it, but there's pieces of it that I do use. And part of the journey that I went on was this interest in science and curiosity about the natural world, which made me more fascinated by the natural world and more interested in understanding the processes And that eventually led me to witchcraft and a earth-based practice. You know, I went through this like scientific study and then it led me back to a place where now I pass on my witchcraft information to other people. And so I thought I was just thinking about like the paths that we go on in life and how they lead us places that might be unexpected. And I think that that matches with the hero's journey. It's like the hero doesn't know exactly what to expect. Like you think of the Hobbit, that's kind of a classic example of the hero's journey. And it, mm-hmm. it's called an unexpected journey because he encounters so many things that he doesn't expect on the journey. Um, so you set out thinking you're doing one thing and then you encounter all these different things that lead you into other directions. And so I felt like it fit really well with the world card. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'm also thinking about that piece of like the hero is returning home and everybody else is the same. And the, the and the hero is like, no, everything is different, which absolutely happens to Frodo in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. But I think that that relates to your story too, in that you went on this journey to get this degree, expecting one thing, and then you returned home, as it were, you weren't returned to the workforce, you returned to not life in school, and was like, yeah, no, that's not, that's not what my degree is going to be used for. That's what, not what my knowledge is for. Right. And like the main thing that I t- I have from that is, like I said, the interest in the natural world. And now, of course, with like I was on the plant ID team and competed for identifying plants. And so I still use that, like especially with this podcast when we talk about plants each week. So, yeah, it just like gives you things that you aren't you're expecting to use one way and then you end up using them in a different way. <laughs> mm-hmm. It was really fun for me to think about the world this way, because I think this card gets sort of confusing for people. And and this gave me a new perspective to look at it too, because I hadn't always thought of it in terms of the like sharing what you know piece. Mm-hmm. And it, it was always like when it came up, the first thing that would pop into my head is the world is your oyster. Like you've you've reached the end, you're at the pinnacle. But I think it is really important that piece of like sharing that then going on and sharing what you know as well. The beginning Agreed. again. So this week we are talking about Yule, or in this bonus episode, I should say. Before we get into that, just want to give you some background information about the Wheel of the Year, because we did this in, in the Samhain episode as well. But if you didn't listen to that, we wanted to make sure that you understand what we're talking about. So the Wheel of the Year is a way to recognize the important turning points in nature's annual journey through the seasons. And I really love following the Wheel of the Year because it's a reminder to reconnect with the natural world and the fluctuating energy of the sun. Yeah, and much of this cyclical calendar is based on the agricultural timing of planting crops in the spring, watching them grow in the summer, harvesting them in the fall, and then resting and preparing in the winter. And many of us modern people who are not farmers don't necessarily need to be preoccupied with this agricultural calendar. However, there is something to be said for aligning with these themes throughout the year. And even just having a small garden or flower pot, you can still watch these changes and see how they go. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you don't have to have a full-fledged farm. That was a nice alliteration. (laughs) (laughs) Talking about the wheel of the year, there are four solar holidays or sabbats, and these are related to the position of the sun, 
So from year to year, these date the date of these is going to be slightly different. Sometimes it's the same day. But this is the spring equinox, which you might know as Ostara, summer solstice or Letha, fall equinox or Mabin, and the winter solstice, which of course we're talking about today, Yule. And then the four other sabbats of the eight are fire festivals. So these are Imbolg, Biltna, Lunasa, and Samhain. So again, we're talking about Yule because this is the date that's coming up in the Northern Hemisphere. If you are a Southern Hemisphere listener, then you would be celebrating Letha, the longest day of the year. And there's some information about that sabbat in the show notes. Just go to mumblesandthings.com slash blog slash zero five zero. So this sabbat is known as the winter solstice, which is the shortest day of the year. And it's marking the transition between the days getting shorter and the days beginning to grow longer. Now, modern calendars tell us that Yule is the beginning of winter. But in a time when most humans grew their food, Yule was the middle of winter, which is why one of its names is actually midwinter. So Samhain would have been considered the first day of winter, and the season would last through in bulk at the beginning of February. And I think that's an important thing to mention, because again, many of these traditions that our ancestors, wherever they were in the world, were based on their environment, their circumstances, and their beliefs. So when you are building a practice for yourself, you can follow that based on your environment, your circumstances, and your beliefs. And I've talked about this before, but living in Florida, there are different seasonal changes than what people might experience in a more temperate area of the world. But that's what is really wonderful about witchcraft is that you have this freedom to do things your own way and develop traditions that make sense for where you live, the resources that you have, and what you believe in. So we will be presenting some traditional practices and activities, which actually do align with the natural changes in Colorado, where I live. We definitely have four seasons here in Colorado, although it hasn't snowed yet, and I'm very upset about it. (laughs) And as we talk about the Yule activities, we invite you to reflect on whether they are authentic to how you practice witchcraft and what you notice about the seasonal changes in your area. But before we talk about the practices, let's talk about some mythology, history, and traditions surrounding Yule. It's that time of year that has been celebrated by many cultures throughout history. Should we just do a singing podcast? (laughs) Deck the halls with boughs of holly, fa la 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 la. Tis the season to be jolly, fa la 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 la. Don we know our gay apparel, fa la 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 la. Tall the ancient Yule tide carol, fa la 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 la. It's gonna be off in the recording. The winter solstice is an ancient holiday that has been celebrated by many cultures throughout the world for thousands of years. The modern witch can celebrate the winter solstice in a variety of different ways, including ritual magic, divination, feasting on traditional foods, sending gifts to friends and family, decorating their homes, and celebrating nature's beauty as winter is coming to an end. The ancient Celts recognized the winter solstice as the end of the year and the start of the next. Many modern witches call their winter solstice celebration Yule, which is a word that comes from the old Norse word Yule, spelled J-O-L, meaning wheel. This was in reference to the wheel of the year, which marks the cycle of the seasons. Another winter solstice celebration is Saturnalia, which is celebrated on December 17th. It is a Roman festival that honored the god Saturn. So this festival started with sacrifices to Saturn, which were followed by the lighting of candles that were representative of hope for better things to come in the next year. And many Romans also use this time period for exchanging gifts. But the most famous celebration surrounding the winter solstice is probably Christmas. Many of these traditions, however, predate Christianity. Christmas commemorates the birth of Jesus Christ. Instead of the return of the sun, S-U-N, it is the return of the sun, S-O-N, the son of God. 
While there are many different aspects to Christmas, it typically includes gift giving, caroling, and spending time with family and friends. So people all around the world celebrate the winter solstice and this season in different ways. Whatever you call it, this is a time to give thanks for all that we have been given over the past year and to look forward to the coming year. There is a strong focus on family and friends during Yule, and it is a reminder of the importance of togetherness during this time. This is a time when we can come together to celebrate the return of the light and the promise of a new year. So how can we honor this time of year? Well, we'll tell you after we talk about the herb of the week. And this episode is brought to you by Pine. So Erica is going to tell us about the medicinal properties of pine, and then I will share the magical properties. There are over 60 species of pine growing in North America alone. So it's hard to pin down just one name for you. But general rule of thumb, you can use any sort of pine evergreen with the same outcomes. However, I do recommend caution and to research what is native in your own areas because they will be different. Pine is great just in time for cold and flu season because it is chock full of vitamin C. It has a lot of really great respiratory benefits because it has that vitamin C. It has the aroma that is good for clearing out sinuses. It has those the essential oils that help to bring out those aromatics. Uh, it can be used as an expectorant, as a circulatory s- system stimulant. It is an immune system stimulant as well, and it can also help with grief support. So a tea of the needles or a decoction of the needles can be used for respiratory and bronchial complaints. It can help remove and thin the mucus from the lungs. It can also be used for a laryngitis or with small tr- children who have croup. As always, be cautious with use with children and consult a doctor or a licensed herbalist for assistance with dosage. Generally, a pea-sized amount is good for children. I know a lot of people will put some pine in their immunity teas. So anything that helps to boost immunity goes well with pine. It was actually once used to treat scurvy because of how much vitamin C is in it. The sap also has some topical benefits that can be helpful for pulling out splinters for soothing sores and boils. It also can be used to help with sore muscles along with like an arnica to help with that muscle pain. I mentioned the grief support. This goes into the magical side of things a little bit, but because of its effects on the lungs, most of us hold our grief in that part of our body. And so if we are opening up the lungs, there's a belief that we can release some of that grief and we can have it move through us when it gets stuck and when we're feeling particularly vulnerable. It was also considered by many North American indigenous peoples to be a sacred tree and holds cultural significant f- significance for many Native people tribes, and it was known as the tree of peace. As for the magical uses of pine, it corresponds with the active energy, Mars and Saturn, air and earth, and Capricorn. In general, it can be used for clean breaks and new beginnings cleansing and banishing, luck, prosperity, and success, fertility, strength, and longevity, grounding, growth and healing, and joy and happiness. So one of the main uses for pine is as a cleansing herb. So you can create a bundle of pine needles or branches and burn it so that the herbs are smoldering and use that to cleanse and purify a space, especially for if you are 
If you've just moved into a new home, again, that's that new beginnings thing. So you're, you move into a new home and you can cleanse it to create a completely new space for yourself. Or if you've just started a new business and you have a space that you work in, using pine to cleanse that space can be really beneficial. And additionally, with that business aspect, bringing in that element of prosperity and success and good luck. Now, since pine is an evergreen plant, and if you look at the way particularly um, pine nuts grow in the pine cones, it makes this a really good herb or good tree for fertility spells, for strength spells, and for longevity. So there's that evergreen element and then these very big seeds that come out of the pinion pine. Pine trees are often very sturdy. They have a one really sturdy trunk with smaller branches coming off of that. And so a lot of times visualizations for grounding or when you think about grounding in terms of being a tree rooted to the ground, a pine tree comes to mind because it's one trunk with deep roots. And also they grow so tall and straight, particularly like lodgepole pines, that that they can be associated with growth as as well as healing. So in general, you can use this herb in whatever way that you would in magic, whether that's uh, it is. Most pines are edible um, and they add that piney flavor. But of course, check to make sure that the variety or the species that you're using is edible. So if you wanted to use it in kitchen witchcraft, you could add it to your bath magic, you could burn it, as I mentioned, add it to charm bags, add it to a jar spell, whether you're using the needles, the cones, or the branches. Since it's a tree and we don't talk about trees very much, one thing that you can do with trees in general, and if you want to use, if you want to incorporate the pine energy, is to slice the branch into what's called a wood cookie, and then you can use those to make runes, whether that's your elder futhark or witch's runes with those symbols or anything that you want to use for divination. And that would add that like success and prosperity energy, new beginnings energy to your runes. So now we'll get back to our main topic and we will talk about how to celebrate the season of Yule. The colors of Yule are red and green to represent life during winter time. The color red symbolizes the light that is returning during winter darkness and the vitality of the returning sun. And green represents life and abundance. Most trees are bare in the winter in temperate areas of the world, but evergreen remains green, hence the name evergreen. The other night we were talking about the poinsettia because she bought one at King Supers and it was starting to droop. And so she gave it a ton of water and then suddenly it perked up and she's like, that was a lot of water, which she's not really used to with some of our Colorado native plants. And I was like, well, it is a tropical plant after all, like it needs a lot of water. And we were talking about how it was funny that we associate poinsettias with Christmas and winter and Yule and it's this like tropical plant. And I was like, well, maybe we associate it with that time because that's when it turns red, which is the opposite of some of the other plants that their lush fullness is in the summer. Anyway, it was just an interesting thought <laughs> that we were having yeah. about poinsettias. <laughs> that would be an, in- I'd, I'd be interested in researching how the poinsettias became so connected with Christmas time. I mean, not everywhere has the same like wintry experience. Like where I am, I mentioned before, Florida, there's, we don't have the snowy time and it is a, there's a lot of tropical plants. So maybe there's something to that, especially, I feel like a lot of sort of commercialized Christmas traditions come from a time period when it was like really heavily marketed to go on tropical vacations with your family like that was part of the American dream so maybe there's something to that where it's like brought back but it'd definitely be worth looking into other Yule colors include gold and white gold represents the gifts we are given and the solar energy white is a fresh clean slate to begin the next year on It also represents silence and the quiet of winter. So you can use any of these colors, red, green, gold, or white, to decorate your home, your altar, and for the tools and materials you use in rituals and spell work. So I looked up poinsettias. It comes from a story. It's basically the little drummer boy, but it's a girl who doesn't have a gift 
for the baby Jesus. So she picked some weeds that she was walking past on the way to church. And then when she got there and left them at the nativity scene, they, the weeds transformed into beautiful red flowers, which is why the Christmas colors are green, green and red. But I don't think that that's accurate <laughs> because the col- the Christmas colors are from the holly and the ivy. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's what this article said. And they were brought to the United States from Mexico in the early 1800s, but they were popular, popularized on The Tonight Show with Bob Hope. And today, ironically, (laughs) is the U.S. Congress declared December 12th to be National Poinsettia Day. And that's today. That is interesting that we're talking about (laughs) it right now. (laughs) The the answer is I still don't know. (laughs) And as Erica mentioned, green is a color of the evergreens. So using evergreens to decorate your home is a wonderful Yule tradition. Bringing those evergreen plants indoors and adding lights and baubles to them is a common tradition around this time of year. Some other plants, in addition to pine, as we've talked about, are spruce and fir and cedar. The holly tree, which is both red and green, was believed to protect against evil spirits flying in the night. Mistletoe is hung as a symbol and an invitation for all to come together with no quarrels or disagreements because this is a time of peace and goodwill. It also represents fertility. Yule is a time for family and friends, and it's often celebrated with a Yule log, which is burned on the fire. The Yule log was originally a tradition to burn logs in order to bring good luck and prosperity for the coming year. And the log would be chosen carefully as it needed to be from an oak tree that had been struck by lightning. And the oak tree struck by lightning is because people in Viking traditions believed that an oak tree that was struck by lightning was a signal from Thor that this was the proper tree to choose to burn for the celebration because oak is sacred to Thor And Thor, of course, is the god of thunder and lightning. And there also is some overlap with the oak and holly story, which is Celtic in origin, where there's an oak king and a holly king. And throughout the year, they're battling for dominion over the earth. And at Yule, the oak king prevails because the oak, as a deciduous tree, is going to come back as the world warms again and holly is more powerful during the during the cooler months because it is an evergreen and today many witches still choose to burn a yule log as a way to honor these ancient traditions and another fun tradition is to bake a cake and decorate it to resemble an oak log serve this during the celebration and i know that i have made plenty of yule logs with anna i think you've probably done it too and i actually have a cake tin in my amazon wish list oh for- so that it's like a solid cake yeah every time i've made them it's like the swiss roll yeah. It's the Swiss roll, yeah. It is so challenging. They do it on the Great British Baking Show. They make it look so easy. And I'm like, that is not how mine looks. (laughs) (laughs) My first exposure to the Yule Log was through our dad, actually. He loves the Yule Log, but he's also, he honors the, I don't think I would say he worships, but he honors the green man very much. So that's, that would probably, if he, if he were to say he had a patron god, it would be the green man who is also the Oak King. He has made many live Yule logs in the past, and we've always kind of treated it like an advent calendar where we take off pieces of it each day and burn the piece until the last day on the winter solstice, we burn the what's what's left, which I always thought was a neat twist. Yeah, that's a good reminder of that. And if you do burn a Yule log, you can add to your, you know, your bonfire, other herbs that are associated with this time, perhaps pine or nutmeg or peppermint or rosemary or sage, any of these herbs that are associated with Yule, you can add those to your fire to enhance that magic. And as we mentioned before, Yule is also called midwinter. It has been celebrated since Neolithic times with feasts, 
And in the Norse tradition, they honored Odin by actually sacrificing one each of every animal in their herd. And this was thought to ensure good health for the herd throughout the coming year. Because of this, in some parts of the world and in many tradi modern traditions, having a large feast at Yule to celebrate the harvest from the previous three harvest festivals and sharing that with family and friends. Yeah, and I, you know, I've also heard that they've been saving everything for over the winter to get through the the lean months, and everything's been very slim pickings. And then it, here comes the winter solstice, and we're on the way out. It's this mark of we can start to feast again. We we will have good food again. We will have so it's it's almost like a let's get rid of the rest of our storehouse and have this feast because spring is on its way. Right, because winter solstice was this turning point of, of we've made it, you know, halfway through this most challenging time of the year when we don't have more food coming. We're not growing food and most of the plants available to us are not, you know, highly nutritious. And so it was a big celebration of, yes, we've made it this far. We can start to eat normally again, everything that we've saved up for this time period. And for a lot of these cultures, Yule wasn't necessarily just one night or one day. It was several weeks at the end of December and the beginning of January. And in some places, even all the way up to Imbolg or February 1st. Of course, these dates aren't the dates that were used at the time. They had a different calendar system. But Imbolg we'll talk about later on in the podcast, of course, but Imbolg is usually represented by the snowdrop and that plant pushes up through the snow and is this very symbolic plant of life returning to earth. And so for a lot of people, the winter solstice or the Yule celebration lasted from, you know, the shortest day of the year all the way up until the first sighting of life returning to earth. But of course, yeah, we still have these feasts now. A lot of a lot of times Christmas for many people in the West is and who celebrate Christmas is a big time to gather with family and friends and eat and eat and eat and eat <laughs> and share gifts. And I know I have lots of good memories of food and things at Anna and Puppies and continuing that this year. We're going first time to Erica's house for Christmas or Yule meal, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Yeah. It's on Christmas, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that brings us to gift giving, which is another tradition of Yule and other winter solstice celebrations. Gift giving is often the focal sim symbol of many winter traditions. It shows that we care for each other's well-being and that we're committed to help each other survive through the long cold winter months. We're willing to share our good fortune with another person. It's all of these like ideas of what's mine is yours. And I want to share my bounty with you. And I want to show my love and appreciation. I can 100% get behind this because gifts is my love language. And for me, it's a time for me to really, it's almost a ritual for me is I've spent all year listening to the tiny little things that people have said that weren't necessarily a meaningful statement, but things like, I love chocolate chip muffins, or I really like learning about X, you know, all of these inconsequential things that people say. And then at the gift giving season, being able to remember those conversations and those statements and finding a gift that is about that statement and to really show, I listen to you. I care about you. The things you say matter to me. And this is how I show that appreciation. So I really spend a lot of time and effort looking for a gift that is for that person. That's a good skill to have. I was just talking to Dana about how hard it is for me to like gifts. Gifts are not my love language. <laughs> it's, just, it's like the opposite. So that's, it's hard for me to like give gifts because I don't receive gifts that well. <laughs> and so putting myself into that position of giving a gift, it doesn't translate to me as like an act of love. So a lot of times when I give gifts, it's like an act of service or affirmations and things like that. The way I see gifts, and I think what you're saying is that it's like a token of 
like a representation of the relationship. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that you are using as a way to represent something that you've talked about and, and, and you know that that person likes this thing. And so it's like a physical representation of that. And maybe it's because you're an earth sign. So there's like that physical mm, yeah. aspect of it. Cause for, cause for me, the, it's more abstract, I guess. And so mm. it's hard for me to like bring that feeling of like, I care about you into a physical object. <laughs> right. And sometimes it gets me in trouble too. I've come to recognize that people don't view gifts the way that I do, but it, for a really long time, it it bothered me when people be would be like, what's your Christmas list or what do you want for your birthday? Or it would be like, I don't know, pick something that you think I would like, like show me that you know who I am. And now as an adult, I can recognize that not everybody thinks about it like I do. And sometimes I feel like I'm having to do that emotional labor for people by coming up with my own list. <laughs> and so I've come to accept it. And I kind of really try to tailor my Amazon wish list for to things that like, I really want this, but I'm not going to buy it for myself. So if you need that idea, go to my Amazon wish list. <laughs> yeah, I think I like I think that's why knowing people's love languages is, is so important. We're kind of going off on a tangent, but it's still related to gift giving. <laughs> the way you receive love and the way that you give love is different. Every person has a different way of expressing that. And so like being offended by somebody else showing love in a way that you're not used to receiving it, that's like counterintuitive because they're showing you love in the way that they know how to show you. <laughs> well, and I, yeah, it's, it's exactly that. And I remember so many Christmases being disappointed with my gifts because they weren't, they didn't show that that person knew me and feeling so guilty that I was disappointed with a gift. Like that, that I know that they were giving it to me of love, but it wasn't the love language that I needed. And so I've had to do a lot of reflection on that about what gift giving means and how, how to graciously accept gifts that may not fulfill that love language like I need it to. Yeah. And I think I was talking to Dana about this last night as well. It's just, um, I, and we talked about it. I think in last week's episode about the commercialization of Christmas and also of like Halloween and how there's so much pressure to give these extravagant gifts or to like have the best things. And it's taking away from the, the purpose of that, which is this is an act of love. And this is something that I think you would like because you're given a specific day when you have to do that. Mm -hmm. instead of like at a different point in the year when you think of it. Well, and yeah, and so that goes back to why it's part of the Yule tradition and that it's it's about I'm sharing my bounty with you. Right. I have the scene of Little House on the Prairie where Mr. Edwards comes to their first Christmas on the Kansas Prairie and he brings them a candy cane and a penny and uh, each get a tin cup and like, in modern day, like, that's a really small Christmas, <laughs> but like, but it was so meaningful to them. It was so special and so wonderful. And it was a tiny thing that Mr. Edwards could do. And he was sharing his bounty with these little girls. Yes. And, and, you know, they had invited him into their home and this was what he could do in exchange. Mm -hmm. That's such a sweet episode. <laughs> So yeah, like a lot of a lot of people do try to, you know, return to that meaning of the season where people say that Christ is the is the reason for the season or whatever, trying to return it to that origin. But of course, a lot of these traditions predate even Christ, and we know that his birthday wasn't even on the twenty fifth. <laughs> so, <Right. laughs> but that's besides the point. I think with all of this, it's just important to come back to where these come from. And if that is something that aligns with what you believe in and you want to include in your traditions, or you don't, it's okay to not to not do these things as well. Mm -hmm. So something else to think about with the winter solstice, as Erica said, the Celts believed that this was the end of the year and the beginning of the next year. And of course, now with the modern Gregorian calendar, January 1st is the first of the year, but it's the same, you know, seasonal transition. And there's always this sort of weird week between the 
you know, like 21st, 25th, and then January 1st, where you're just like, what do I do with my, what do I do with myself right now? <laughs> it's yeah. sort of this limbo zone. And I think it's because you're kind of wiping the slate clean and giving yourself a rest before you prepare for the next year. Well, and I mean, this, the whole end of the year really is like, because Samhain is considered the witch's new year. And so it's really this whole November, December time period where everything is sort of wrapping up. Businesses are looking at end of year dividends. We've got the Black Friday tradition of it's the first time in the year that the businesses have been in the black and not in the red. You know, that's where that comes from. So it, everything is ending and everything is beginning. And I've been seeing so I don't know if you've seen them, Maggie, but so many memes going around this year where it's like, do not say anything about 2022. This is not your year. We are tiptoeing quietly into yeah. 2022. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Stop baiting the years. <laughs> yeah. 2020, we were like, this is our year. 2021 was 2020 sucks. Like 2021 is going to be so much better. And they both were bad years. So we're just, we're tiptoeing were quietly. Bad, but. <laughs> <laughs> I saw another meme that related to something else. Oh, it was about this time of the year being like rest and recuperation. And somebody had a meme that was like, our ancestors spent this time of the year fasting and saving all of their scraps because they didn't know if they were going to be able to grow more food. So stop trying to make me do stuff right now. Yeah. Like, I should be sleeping. Yep. Exactly. Well, and as they were developing the Gregorian calendar, they would add weeks to of just parties to the end of the year to make it match up, which eventually turned into the months of July and August to honor Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar. But there was like two months worth of just parties at the end of the year. That's what Saturnalia was all about, was just hang out and have a good time. <laughs> yeah, until it resets. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, what happens at the end of the year stays at the end of the year. <laughs> So the next tradition that we have is wassailing or wassailing, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Here we come a wassailing along the leaves so green. Here we go wandering so fast. Basically, this was carrying wassail from your house to other houses along the way and using it to bless the trees and help to ensure a bountiful harvest in the coming year. And so a wassail is a spiced ale or drink that you would share with the people of the household and you would use to sprinkle on the fields and the crops and everything. I mean, honestly, it just sounds like a grand old time. And from this tradition comes our tradition of caroling, where the wassail was changed from wassail to cocoa. cocoa. <laughs> Going around door to door to sing Christmas carols, there's a sense of raising funds and charity work associated with it. It's again part of that sharing the bounty with others and showing that you care and that you wish well in the new year. Yeah, it's all about goodwill to all. And to all a good night. And to all a good night. <laughs> So with all of that, we hope that however you celebrate the winter solstice, Yule, or any other name you want to use for this time of year, that it is filled with joy and peace. My holiday socks are six stops away. Wow, that was a tongue twister. <laughs> well, that's exciting. I know. I need them for tomorrow. We're doing two weeks of holiday spirit week. Tomorrow is holiday sock day. Oh, then you definitely need them. Mm-hmm. I have had these socks in my drawer for the longest time, and I thought that they were shamrock socks. Sh shamrock socks. <laughs> <laughs> See, socks makes it a tongue twister. <laughs> I thought they were shamrock socks that Anna had given me for St. Patrick's Day, because mm. when they're folded over, you know, you can only see like the inside and the embroidery and the way that it looks is like not the actual picture. Mm. So it looked like little white shamrocks on green socks. I ran out of socks to wear though. So I was like, I guess I'll wear my lucky socks. <laughs> and they are the cutest socks. They're penguins with Santa hats on them. 
<laughs> so, I was very excited. Not shamrocks? Them. They're not shamrocks at all. <laughs> <laughs> but they've been sitting in my drawer. I see them all the time. Like, oh, those are my shamrocks. <laughs> I don't even know why I had it in my head that they were that way. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> We are celebrating goddesses from around the world this season. For each goddess, we will give you a theme to think about that she represents for creating a ritual or spell or some sort of witchy work. And I am choosing from the goddess deck Legendary Ladies by Anne Shen. And this week we picked Gaia. She is the Greek world goddess to fit with our world tarot card. Her theme is connection to nature. Mother of all living things on earth, Gaia appears before you as a sign to return to nature. You need to get grounded by reconnecting with the earth. Try planting your feet on the natural ground, going on a hike, or taking a forest bath. Go back to mother earth for the answers you are seeking. What's her theme word again? connection to nature. How will you connect to nature this week, Miss Maggie? Well, I connect to nature every week. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But this week, I'll make an extra special effort to connect to nature in reference to the Yule season and recognizing the, you know, the length of day and just how that's affecting the plants around me. Just a regular Yule tradition that I have is walking, going for a walk and thinking this way. But it fits because now I can say that it's in the name of Gaia. <laughs> what yeah. about you? How will you invite Gaia into your week and connect to nature? Well, so climate change is a thing. And we have had the warmest December in history. It was like 75 degrees a couple weeks ago. And that's not normal for Colorado. And the lack of snow is really bumming me out. So I think I'm going to go try and do a snow dance and encourage the normal seasons to come about. So with the hope of having a white Yule or a white Christmas. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Just very musical episode. We'll wait until you get here, though, so that we can... uh get you here safely. I'm going to invite Gaia to be herself and fight for winter. If you would like to share with us how you are inviting Gaia into your week, how you will connect to nature, go to witchwanderer.com and answer that question. For the next episode, Eric and I will be looking for the Queen of Pentacles in our day-to-day -day life. And this card represents a dependable, nurturing, warm-hearted, sensuous, generous, and earth-motherly person. And they are a person who takes realistic view of life. They are matter-of-fact, reliable, and loyal. They enjoy creating a loving and secure home for the people that they live with. They have a desire to help other people love animals and children and they're just creative and resourceful so we're going to be looking for people like this in our lives times when we felt like we embodied this person if you have a story about the queen of pentacles please send us a voicemail at we listen at talkwitchcraft.com you can find out more about this episode by going to mumblesandthings.com slash blog slash zero five zero join us next week when we talk about how to make the most of Capricorn season. Make sure that you subscribe so that you are notified about each new episode and help other witches find this show by leaving us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also find us on Instagram at Mumbles and Things and join us in the Mumbles Academy to chat about this episode with other witchy folk. Goodbye. Goodbye. For each goddess, we want to give a theme. What was that? Motorcycle. Oh, I thought you had a ghostie in your room. <laughs> oh.